Jesus, Jesus, how I love you, how I live, how my voice with your praise, Holy Spirit, I implore my heart as my limbs upon your grace I am persuaded Lord to love you I have been changed to bless your name
while you're standing I want you to do something for me we say this in Sunday school clear the canvas of your imagination consider all of the possibilities that exist in God and particularly when we praise him the Bible tells us that God inhabit the praises of his people now we understand that praise is God's prescription for changing our environment praise Hosea 6 and 3 says and he shall come to us as the rain water evaporates from the earth goes into the sky forms clouds clouds drop rain the older saints taught us when praises go up they become evaporation in the clouds and God takes praises and rains blessings back down on us you who know you are given to praise that your hands were created by God for praise and he breathed into you the breath of life that you would lift up your voice as a speaking spirit and command the language that he has given you and proclaim his praise I want to give you 30 seconds just to use the language whatever language God gave you command it in such a way that it moves God off his throne zone. he takes up habitation among us let's praise him just for a moment is he not worthy Come on, we're talking about the ancient of day, the lifter of our heads, the lover of our souls, the righteous one, the lover of justice, almighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. He stands alone. Who among the sons of men can be compared unto him? Nobody like our God. Nobody like Adonai. Nobody like Jehovah Rapha. Who can heal you and not send your bill? Come on, who can deliver you, not send you a bill? Who can reach way down and pick you up? Nobody like our God, Jehovah Mikadeskim, when he sets you apart and sanctifies you unto himself. Nobody, he says, can snatch you out of my hand. Anybody know you're kept by his loving arm? Come on, anybody know? I'm talking about praises now. Will you help me praise him? With the clapping of your hands, the lifting of your voice, I know you're tired I'm tired too I had one hour of sleep in the last 24 hours but he's worthy to be praised look at somebody and tell them neighbor I don't know what you come to do but I come to praise him I come to praise him give distinction to your praise God made you fearfully and wonderfully and uniquely and value is seen in difference value is seen in distinction there is no anointing for you to be somebody else not even in your praise so if you didn't learn like i did as a young boy how to dance and cross your leg just leap and praise it if you didn't learn how to clap on the two and four we'll accept the one and three just don't clap so loud but if you got breath in your body, you owe God a praise. I need some Sunday school folks that know the scripture. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Yes! The psalmist dropped down and says it's like the all that ran down from Aaron's beard. And there God commanded the blessing. It's impossible for saints to get together and not praise him. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I can't help but praise him. Yes! Oh, you're talking, looking at a country boy, 53 years old, but I wasn't always saved. God done some incredible things in my life, and I'm here to speak well of him tonight. Thank you for this moment. Will you bow your head? Father, my father, oh, that you would breathe upon us tonight. Consider our human frailty. Let the weightiness of your presence scatter the darkness. Surely you're God. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You have come to add to us tonight. Not subtract from us. Where your spirit is, there is liberty. You grant us a liberty in your presence to take that which belongs to us, that which is the children's bread. You who are sick in your body, will you lift your hands and receive healing tonight? Take your liberty in God. Oh, my Father, thank you. Come on, receive it by telling him thank you. 
Thank you for my healing. Thank you for my breakthrough. Thank you for the open door. Thank you for my peace. Thank you for my joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, my Father, let your word stretch us, breathe life into us. Let there be no ambiguity or equivocation that you are talking to us tonight. Yes, mark us as only you can, that you might be glorified in all things, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Will you repeat after me, Revelations 1, 5, and 6? And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God. To him be glory and dominion now and forever. And all the kings and the priests said, Amen. Clap your hands and take your seat. I'm trying to set us up tonight as we take a little ride tonight. Tell somebody you're a king and a priest under God. And there's a high expectation on your life as a king and priest of God. Let me do this. I have quite a bit of recognition and deference to give, but I want to start with the presiding bishop of our church tonight. Help me celebrate Bishop J. Drew Sheard, an incredible leader. The finest that we have in this hour and uh, has a heart for people and given to hospitality, a great anointed preacher. It's, it's an honor to serve him. He's a man's man. Thank God for a man's man with masculinity, knows how to dress. Smooth, y'all ain't talking back to me. Tall and good looking. Got a beautiful wife by his side. Who wouldn't follow him? Even if I wasn't saved, I'd just follow him. He just got that swag. That's not flattering. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. And we got something in common. His roots is in Mississippi. That's right. I'm a Mississippi boy. To the first and second presiding bishop of our church, two incredible men. Come on, help me celebrate our leaders at help hold the arm of our presiding bishop to the entire presidium of our church. All of them are my friends. Thank you, Bishop Porter, my big brother. Many of you have had me and allowed the Sunday school to come and share. I love you. Thank you for what you do. To the board of bishops, Bishop Galbraith, and all of the leaders of the ecclesiastical work of our church, God bless you. We honor you and salute the work that you do. To the chairman of the General Assembly, I see Bishop Thuston back there tonight looking good he's funny he's a funny preacher he makes me laugh in, uh, in his own distinction uh, you gotta love him and gift a great theologian intellectual but a great preacher and anointed preacher we're blessed to have him as our chairman can you say amen and to mother barbara kumba lewis let's praise god for the supervisor of our church she's not here supervisor of women credit all of her cabinet to again the first lady of our church evangelist Dr. Karen Clark Shear. Come on, help me celebrate her. Uh, she is uh, quite expensive to look at. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because every time my wife look at her, she get an idea. It's expensive having you as a first lady. <laughs> I love it, though. I love it. I love it. I love it. To the chairman of this great conference, my friend and brother, I love Bishop Linwood Dillard. I love you, man. You're my guy. I want to see you go far. And uh, God has given him to us as a gift to his lovely wife. They've been married 23 years. I've been married 23 years. I'll get to my right rib in a moment. And to all of these department leaders, my friends and brothers and sisters that share in this work, it's an incredible work. I know we're all exhausted, but you know I love you. I praise God for you. Amen. And to all the vice chairs who undergird, Dr. Chris Payton, man, thank God for you. Love you. Looking good tonight. Got your yellow touch tie on and your white bracelet. Amen. You sharp, man. Pastor Gary Spreewell, what can we say about him on last night? Did he not preach in here? I got a little jealous of him. He had that white robe on looking like Reverend Ike. I wanted to get me one. And they threw together that video on me. And he looking in the white robe. I wanted a white robe. I'm going to change my video introduction. Hey, man, I might need your fan, okay? Not as heavy, but I might need your fan tonight. 
I love him to all the people of God. To Mother Penix, my international field representative. 48 years of serving in the Sunday School Department. Incredible gift to us. And um, thank God for your work. To all of the bishops' wives and to all of the men and women of God who serve in a national um, role in our church. To my own jurisdictional bishop, Bishop James Proctor and Supervisor Ruby Terry. Anybody from Louisiana, help me celebrate. Uh, all of the bishops in Louisiana have played some role in my life and uh, I appreciate them on every, on every stance. Uh, tonight, I want to honor the entire executive staff of the Sunday School Department. I want them to stand tonight. If you work in our executive team, will you stand? Help me celebrate Sunday School. Thank you. Incredible people. Dr. Kathy Oliver, you prayed tonight. Praise God. All of these leaders, Superintendent Atkins, a giant of a man, Superintendent Carl Davis, I could go on, Evangelist uh, Waynell, that Sunday school girl, Evangelist Charla, Elder Derek Watts, our finance person, I could go, uh, attorney judge, we got attorney judge, Anthony Parker working with us in our leadership, and I could go on and on about those who serve in our executive team. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, let me celebrate UCFM, the church uh, that I lead there in Louisiana. I want them to stand. Come on, my young people. Uh, we make an incredible investment. Thank you to come to be a part of this. And, uh, and so I tell them that they must raise that level of faith. We don't come. This is a very expensive proposition to come here, uh, to put money in the airline industry, hotel industry, food industry. Uh, we are feeders of systems, but not leaders of systems. So we must, we must look at how we get a return on this investment. And I, I know every year we, since we have been coming, we have seen an increase in our capacity and what we do in the kingdom of God back at home. Can you say amen? Our youth just released their second single, Can't Tell It All. It's on every platform. I got to give it up to them. Uh, they're doing an incredible job. To my mother and father who's watching me back at home, pray for my father who was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, aggressive in the last stage of it, but he's already got the victory, and we're believing God for you. Love you, mother and father. To my own family, my wife, I want her to stand. Lady Mary Ellis, been married to her 23 years. That's my right rib. I ain't looking for spare ribs. And uh, when I married her and started ministry, the Lord told me three things. Teach the word of God with simplicity. Keep your hands clean and love your wife. And he says, and I'll cause whatever you touch to prosper. I tell every man who's doing the Lord's work, you don't have to be smart to walk with God, but you do have to know how to follow an instruction. In the next 20 years, God blessed me so much so until I retired at 45 years old, never having to work another day in my life. God told me I could kiss my way to promotion. Tell every man, there comes a time in your life where you know you love your wife, but you might not like her. You got to go in your secret closet and learn to meditate. Hello, somebody. And let God do a work on your heart. You can't afford to miss and mess up the conduit to your blessing. God told me if you work harder inside the house, you won't have to work as hard outside the house. And I've been kissing my way to promotion the last 23 years. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. The kissing I got in store for my wife. Yes, sir. I keep my eyes on the prize. Elder Michael Payton, special leader in the Sunday School Department. Help me celebrate that Mr. Saturday Night Sunday School. He's my leader of learning and development, the academy that most of what you see uh, we wouldn't be much of a department without him. I appreciate him, his wife, and his family that lends him to the world. What an incredible leader. Thank you, Elder Payton. He has a table. He's probably working now outside. We have a Sunday school table. We'd love for you to frequent our table. Take a look at what we have out there. T-shirts. You can buy a ticket to our scholarship breakfast. And uh, that helps us for those who are teaching in Christendom around the world who can't afford these world-class trainings that we put together. Your investment in our scholarship program helps us to offer scholarships to those who can't afford it to get the best of the best training so we can close the knowledge gaps and skill gaps. Come on, somebody. We can eradicate biblical illiteracy around the world. And that's what Bishop Sheard and this church has tasked us with doing. And we're doing an incredible job thus far 
if I have to say so myself. Come on, give God a praise for the entire Sunday School Department. One last thing I want to say to every bishop in our church, please ensure as you evaluate and reflect this year that you have credible leadership in Sunday School leading the charge. We're putting some incredible things in place. We've made an incredible investment in our infrastructure, in our toolkit to help you, but we want to make sure it's getting to your jurisdiction. And if by chance you've got a jurisdictional uh, Sunday school superintendent that's holding multiple offices, it could be a distraction to you and the real vision of eradicating biblical illiteracy and increasing the level of knowledge and wisdom in those that serve and those that you have the spiritual oversight to. We ask again that all of our ecclesiastical leaders uh, make the right investment and help us as we change how we do Christian education in particular in our communities around the world and the church said amen all right if you have a bible turn with me to saint john chapter 4 and verse 14 i'm gonna read one verse and then i'm gonna announce our topic tonight and i'm gonna go for it john 4 and 14 you there all right it says but no one who drinks the water I give will ever be thirsty again the water I give will become in that person a flowing fountain that gives eternal life the water I give will become in that person a flowing fountain that gives eternal life I want to talk from one word say with your neighbor look at somebody to the right or to the left and say this subject with me neighbor flow I want the cameraman to zoom in on my water that's my topic tonight flow take your seat If you go to Sunday school, you understand that we are all defined by the intentions of God. We do well in the spirit when our hearts are attuned to God's purposes concerning our lives. God's affections and God's heart for us has to govern every facet of our being. If we are to walk with God in the spirit, we are to walk in the acceptance of God as a loving father who sees us as his beloved children. Tell somebody, I am the beloved of God. You see, brilliant, faithful fathers have great intentions towards their children. Can I get a witness fathers in the room? Yes, they think ahead. They live with their children yet in the present i've got good news tonight our father daddy god has great plans for you and i jeremiah 29 and 11 tells us i know the thoughts that i have towards you god is a thinking god as a matter of fact god thinks before he speaks some of us could learn from god he says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. In other words, I've got intentions. His intentions says a great deal about who we are and the quality of life that he desires for us to have. Ask someone, neighbor, do you know God's intentions for you? It's okay to know the intentions of your boss, the intentions of your pastor, the intentions of your bishop, the intentions of your family, but what about the intentions of God? This is why, brothers and sisters, prophecy is so important in the New Testament. Prophecy is the future spoken in advance. Dreams and visions that God sends to us opens us up to the claims of God. Tell a neighbor, get ready to dream and receive new vision. Your father has claims on you god has designs on us what's the fascinating truth is the architect of the universe 
has plans and designs on me. I'm made for a specific purpose. And when you discover and determine that purpose, all the intentionality of God begins to open up to you. Consider, I discover God's plans for me. All of the intentionality of God begins to open up for me. And if you're going to be in Christ, because the scripture does say if any man be where? In Christ. Then you must be convinced that God wants to bless you. You're going to be in Christ. You got to believe that God is for you. Romans 8 and 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? Now, here it is. If you are against yourself, you are against God. This is why old mindsets, mindset of self-defeat and victimization has to go. Now, check this out. This might be something you need to write down. Opposition always attaches itself to whatever we don't remove. Opposition attaches itself to whatever we don't remove. This happens in the natural order and the spiritual order. In business, you might have a person you know you need to move. Don't move them and sit on opposition, attach itself to what you don't move. You might have a person in church that you know you misaligned as a pastor. Put them in the wrong position. Leave them there and tell God to deal with it. And seat on greater opposition, attach itself to what you don't remove. We give the enemy actually certain rights over our lives when we fail to partner with God in our ongoing development. Old oh, mindsets and fear-based mindsets have to go. And to my Sunday school students in the room tonight, the biggest paradigm shift in scripture was change concerning covenants. The change of the testament, the old to the new. The Old Testament gave us a relationship with God based upon visitation. God would appear for a while in a fire, in thunder. He would speak in miraculous voices. Great miracles would take place. Armies would rise and be defeated. Giants would fall. Seas would be divided. Signs were everywhere. And then there was a season of drought. And although visitation still occurs at times, life in the New Testament is a different thing. Stay with me. We have progressed from a cultural of visitation to habitation. This is what the scripture would call perhaps great grace. God sent his son to take on all of the burdens and the hideous weight of sin and transgression, past, present, and future. And he gave us the gift of presence in our hearts and in our lives. And when a person gives their life to God, they transfer their trust alone in Jesus Christ alone for the remission of their sins and the gift of eternal life. Can you say amen? This is what we will call the new covenant now. Eternal life is not just a pass into heaven. Eternal life is the divine nature of God living on the inside of you. Tell somebody, I got eternal life. The people went from then being singled out in a fractured nation, surrounded by enemies, and occasionally visited by God in power, to a blessed people. We would parlance the message today and say the people went viral. As newborn Christian, they swept across the nation in only a few centuries. Christianity went from being the upstart and an underground movement to acting as a thorn in the side of, re of, of religions and nations around the world. And then it became the ruling religion of the entire world. We went viral. We became a people that was never seen before. No longer a people blessed because we were chosen, but a people chosen because we were blessed. A people without borders, Christians, beyond race, sanctified believers, beyond nationalities, and other limitations that the world had tried to set. God knew no boundaries when he established a better covenant. Now this paradigm shift between the old and the new 
went from visitation to a habitation culture and it gives us a new schism between our old selves and our new selves. The resurrection wasn't just an awe-inspiring supernatural event. Do you not know that the resurrection was a metaphor for how we were intended to be from now on, a plan, a pattern, a message, an exhortation to us that we were to be reborn. Now, unlike the season of visitation, there is no call. I need you to wake up now. There is no call for revival in the New Testament. There is no call for revival anywhere in Scripture in the kingdom culture of habitation. The church, quite simply, is to never need reviving. Revival is not about getting people saved. Revival is about the church coming back to her original purpose before God. Now it's a sad reality when we actually have to pray for revival because it means the church is a long way from what God wants us to be. But a touch from God can bring us back. For me, revival can be defined as the church coming back to a place where God can trust us with the things he really wants to give us. And when this happens, there will be real reformation, a move of God where the walls of the church will be knocked flat, where we will have in the meetings, glory to God, what we have in our meetings will also happen in the marketplace. I'm concerned when we can have great church in here and little effect in the marketplace. No, when, when real reformation takes place, miracles will be full in full evidence. People will get saved by the thousands. This is what the scripture teaches us when it says, creation is longing for the sons of God to move in power. I believe that the imperative need of the day is not simply revival, but a radical reformation that will go to the root of our moral and spiritual disorder the root of our disease and deal with the causes rather than the consequences. Deal with the disease rather than the symptoms. Can you say amen? Brothers and sisters, to experience this move of God, we've got to let Jesus inhabit us. John 7 and 37, he says, uh, we must drink of something called living water. On the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and let him drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will rivers of living water. If we are thirsty to fulfill the impossible call of God on our life, we need to drink in God's love and allow him to fully inhabit our lives. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus would use water as an allegory? Uh, he uses it several times in scripture to explain his effect on the earth. In John 4 in our text, he meets a woman at a well. And he tells us, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink. And he would have given you living water. Say with me, living water. And Jesus went on to add, and whosoever would drink this water that I shall give him would never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. Now we've got to live with some context in this scripture because a Jewish man would not speak to a woman in public, much less a hated Samaritan. So what's on God's mind? This God who inhabited eternity but also inhabit in the earth. But what's on his mind when he sends Jesus to meet a woman he ain't supposed to be talking to? Jesus surprises her by engaging in the conversation. He offers her living water, an invitation to believe in him. Then he says, go and call your husband and come back. She says, I have no husband. Y'all know the text. Uh, she replied, Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. 
Now, some scholars suggest the reason Jesus reveals uh, the reason she came alone uh, is because perhaps her past as a woman shunned her from other women. No woman would go to the well alone, but she had to go by herself to avoid judgment and to avoid rejection. Whatever was true about her life, she likely had an experience of deep pain, feelings of unworthiness. Too often in this human predicament that we live in, we too are acquainted with feelings of insecurity, past mistakes and failures. Hello, somebody. And if we don't go to God right, we amass the pain and the hurt. We amass the shame. Hello, somebody. Only to fall and repeat it later on up the road. But the story, if you studied, is really not about morality. It's not a story about Jesus liberating a woman from her own sex life. It is a story about Jesus revealing himself as the Messiah, watch this, to a fellow human being in whom he sees something. Tell somebody, God sees something in me. He sees in this woman genuine spiritual hunger. He sees in this woman a learned and an engaged mind. Tells his disciples, I must need go through Samaria. I see something before you see it. He sees in this woman a tremendous gift for preaching. He sees in this woman a, a tremendous gift for evangelism. He sees in this woman a tremendous gift of faith. Moreover, do you not know that she is the first person into whom Jesus reveals his identity to in John's gospel? A woman with a jacked up sex life is the first person Jesus reveals his identity to. My God, my God. This might be the most compelling fact of the text. She is the first person, the first believer in any of the gospels, watch this, to straightway, say with me straightway, become an evangelist. No school, no walking with Jesus for three years. The first one to straightway become an evangelist and bring her entire city to a saving knowledge of Jesus. He saw something in her. Tell somebody Jesus sees something in me. It is the intentions of God that is to define us, not the intentions of men. Men will use you where they need you. God will only use you how he designed you. We've got to be careful because we promote people to that level of incompetence. And I can anoint you and put you in the office, but if God didn't put you there, I can't ask God to bless what he didn't start. He sees something in her and he chooses to acknowledge the fact of what he sees. And then he reveals himself to her. And straightway, she becomes an evangelist to the city. The tragedy we've made so many people evangelists. They still ain't got nobody saved. They got talent and a voice to sing, but can't get nobody saved. Some of them, Jesus had never even revealed himself to them. Because what you see, he don't see. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Too often our ambition collides with our calling. We're ambitions for titles and positions and seats on the table. But if God didn't call you there, hello somebody. The great tragedy of the Christian experience is to be successful in the wrong assignment. You bring your whole family into calamity. when You're trying to operate in a space that God didn't call you. I might need to turn in some keys tonight and go back. Hello somebody. I need to take the call off tonight. Hello, somebody. Jesus breaks rules. Let me get out of here in a moment. He breaks rules to interact with this woman because he sees something. He sees something. He sees in this woman, say with me, a flow. He reveals himself where he can get a flow. We pumping and prying people because they don't have no we got to keep incentivizing people and giving them a salary and calling their name every time we get up because they ain't got no got no flow he says when I reveal myself to you Bishop I appreciate what you're doing but they ain't gonna need your title 
They ain't gonna need you to call their name. What will bubble up in them will be a river that flows straightway. Straightway. It was not appropriate for a Jewish man to converse with this woman, much less to ask her for a drink. This sort of thing is not done. Sometimes bishops and leaders and pastors, we've got to get in the spirit, we've got to get in the floor of the Holy Ghost and see what other folks don't see. See why God, hello somebody, has anointed, God has already commissioned something to flow. And we got to break rules sometimes. We got to be willing to expense our reputation for God's glory. But when the woman mentions to Jesus after the conversation, watch this, that she's waiting for the Messiah, he declares to her, I am the one. This woman believed Jesus immediately and she learned something. Check it out what she learned. She learned that the love of God frees us to share that love with other folks. God, in an initial encounter, created within the woman a new identity. What is the truth that sets us free from a sin-focused lifestyle? It is this, God does not deal with your old self. I'm finna free somebody in the next 15 seconds. God does not deal with your old self. So when you're trying to tell God, help me stop lying. Help me stop fornicating. He can't do it. Because that behavior is housed in the old man. And in his eyes, he buried the old man. The old man went to the cross with Jesus. So you're asking even God to do something that he can't do. He can't resurrect the old man that he declared buried with Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, you got baptized and went down in the water. Why are you asking him to fix what's old? If you don't want to see what's old, quit focusing on the old. This is why you struggle for 30 years with pornography. Keep coming to the altar, getting saved over and over again. The devil is alive. Keep the old man dead. Old men can't, dead people can't talk. When you realize your deadness trying to rise up and give voice to your future, cancel the assignment. Speak back to yourself and say, I've been crucified with Christ Jesus. Nevertheless, I live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. When Jesus revealed himself to this woman, she caught her new identity. Got her flow. Forgot her reputation in the old man. Went back to town boldly and told everybody, come meet another man. Wait a minute, you done had five? And the one you're with now ain't your husband? And you want us to come see another man? That's what Jesus would do when he get a hope to you. Paul says, I've been apprehended by him. When Jesus get a hope to you, you'll forget the shame of your past. You'll say, nevertheless, I live in the life I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God. Can you say amen tonight? Yes. Yes. He delivers us from a sin-focused lifestyle. God has created a whole new identity in you. He doesn't deal with the old man. The Holy Ghost doesn't engage to modify the behavior of your old self. He says Jesus buried it. The Holy Ghost is only focused on your new man. He only engages you when you're ready to walk in your new identity. Identity is the key to transformation. Lay aside your old self. Count your old self already dead. Tell somebody I'm already dead. Inhabitation then fulfills us at the deepest level. It divides our soul from our spirit. It divides our conscience from our ability to commune with God. It's what the Apostle John refers to as the word of God. Splits our spiritual being from our soulish behavior. You remember what the Paul says in Hebrews? We believe Paul is the writer. For the word of God is alive. Or quick, he says. Powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to divine sunder of soul and spirit. 
and of the joints and of the marrow. It's a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What is the Hebrew writer informing us? He's informing us to keep these two things apart. He is informing us how to teach our soul to be the vehicle to the movement of our spirit. He is informing us, keep our soul exclusively to be the vehicle to the movement of our spirit. You got to keep our soul exclusively to be the vehicle to the movement of the spirit. So when God quickens you, your mind, will, intellect, emotions, and imagination stands ready in charge. You could have just failed seven times, but when the spirit quickens you, you get back up. Hello, somebody, that shame can't keep you down. You say, as Paul says, when he was rejected by church, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by the will of men, but by the will of God. And I am what I am, and it's by the grace of What is this grace? It's this grace of habitation. When we encounter Jesus, we remain in him. He then has the grounds to carry out what I call his divine dispensing in us. When I remain in Jesus, Jesus then has the grace to make me a divine dispenser. Tell somebody I'm getting rid of my cup mentality tonight. We've been singing too long, Lord, fill my cup. And God's trying to make you a fountain. A cup is too small to flow. Y'all ain't talking back to me. A cup can spill, but it can't flow. If all you got is a cup, you're going to need more visitation. Hello, somebody. You can't wait to get back to church because you need another feeling. But God says, if you believe on me, as the scripture have said, I'll make a... You'll get in your flow going to work. You'll get in the flow of the Holy Spirit. Faced with adversity, get in the flow of the Holy Spirit. Faced with tribulation and persecution, you'll begin to speak in your own unknown tongue. Your spirit man will be edified. Get in the flow of the Holy Spirit and the Lord will give you divine knowledge. I worked in corporate America 60 hours a week as a U.S. Vice President. There are many times I would go to Stanford, Connecticut and I wasn't prepared for the functional review. Sometimes I would have to go to Wall Street with my CEO to ring the bell and talk to the analysts about how stock was performing. And I wouldn't be up on all the knowledge. And I would feel like I'm going to be fired. And I would get in the car flying to JFK. Get in the car and get on the highway going up to 95. And the Holy Spirit would say, get in the spirit. And I start praying in tongues. Yeah, I'm not I just start speaking and getting in the floor of the Holy Spirit. I walk in the room. Hello, somebody. Disrupt the whole conversation with a question. God give me a question and shift the whole conversation. I leave the meeting and the CEO says, man, I love how your mind thinks. Did you hear what I just said? When the enemy tries to make you feel like you ain't good enough, you don't have sufficiency for the assignment given to you. Get in the flow. There's a fountain on the inside of you waiting to bubble up unto everlasting life. Uh, but brothers and sisters, before we get to the floor, we got to move past just salvation. Tell somebody salvation is one thing, conversion is another. Uh, many folks in the church have just stopped with salvation. But you and I are called to be converted into the image of Jesus. Salvation without conversion isn't good taking us anywhere. Because life with Jesus is a journey. Tell somebody life with Jesus is a journey. We need to learn how to be transformed and conformed to the nature of God. This is why every church needs a school, a Sunday school. Life is not just about coming to Jesus. It's about becoming Christ-like, becoming like Jesus. Tell somebody, I know you came to Jesus, but are you becoming like Jesus? And if this is the case, brothers and sisters, devotion is being about being and not about doing. We try to look good calling our prayer and fasting meetings. I'm concerned when we got to go to live on social media every time we're talking to God. Every time we're trying to prove we're in devotion. The devil is a lie. Devotion is about what you be, not what you do. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Yes, it's about being married, not Martha. There's no place for us to rush to when we're already in Christ Jesus. God in us, we're already in his presence. Life is not about coming to Christ. It's about becoming Christ-like. And as believers, brothers and sisters, 
we don't strive to get in the place with Christ. Tell somebody we already there. I'm about to help you in a moment. I said we already there. Tell somebody enjoy it. Embrace the love of God himself. He's your alpha and your omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he's everything in between. And because God's presence is always with us, he's the answer to every spiritual warfare you're going to face. He's the peace that overshadows your life when powerful weapons of the enemy come against you. God is not asking you to strive to pull down things. He's commanding you simply to make room for him to act. If he's already on the inside, I don't need you to go to battle, God says. Just make room for me to act. I don't need you to fight. Just make room for me to act. So when you're faced with adversity, don't put up your dupes, lift up your hands. Make room for me to act. I inhabit praises. The psalmist says, my defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. And so the goal of the church must be to facilitate the presence of God. Facilitate the presence of God. Church isn't about meetings, it's about worship. And the Holy Spirit wants to do two things in us every day when we worship. First, he wants to get us to a place where we trust God for everything. This is why he waits till you get jacked up, messed up, like the woman at the well. And can't nobody help you but him. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh huh. You, God had to wait till you get down to your last dime. He had to wait till your change gets strange and your money get funny. For you could do what? Trust him for everything. And then he wants you to trust him with everything. Secondly, he seeks for us to bring to a place where he can what? Trust us. It's one thing in worship for us to get out of worship what God can do for us. But worship involves us becoming trustworthy. Let me slow down here. Do you know why we call this the altar? The altar is literally called the place of opportunities. Or what we call opportunities for commitment. Did you hear what I just said? The altar is called opportunities for commitment. So the altar is not for the unbelievers, for the believer. Altars are built to gain access. And then secondly, to acknowledge access. So believers ought to always come to the altar because they acknowledge it, they got access to God. Believers always come to the altar because they want to continue their flow. I want to take 30 seconds and tell you, make an altar right there where you stand. Make an altar right there where you stand. And let the devil know you got access to God. Every now and then I just go to the altar to remind the devil, he can't stop my flow. He can't stop my flow. Hello, somebody. And every time you come to the altar, you show God you are trustworthy. Now watch this. God will always trust what he sees manifested of the Son of God in our lives. He ain't going to trust your gift. He ain't going to trust your talent. He ain't going to trust your resume or your degree. He will only trust what he sees manifested of the life of Jesus on the inside of you. And I'm completely convinced that there's a place in God where we can confuse and exhaust our enemies in our lives. This is a place in the spirit where God is trying to get us. And I'm about to close. Paul tells us of what he believes the church can become in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and 18. We can become like the woman at the well. Paul says, now if the ministry of death which was engraved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at the face of Moses because it's fleeting glory. Will not the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of habitation, the ministry of Christ in you, the hope of glory, will not this ministry have much more glory as the ministry of righteousness? Indeed, he says, what once was glorious has no glory now in comparison to the glory that surpasses it. For if what was fading away came with glory, how much more than the glory of which will endure? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Tell somebody, I don't care about your past. Stay bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were closed. For to this day, he says, the same veil remains at the reading of the old covenant. It is not being lifted because only in Christ can the veil be removed. 
And even to this day, he says, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Y'all better be careful. Hello, somebody. Because I'm hearing theologians preaching from the old covenant and you're preaching like your eyes still veil. Whenever someone turns to Jesus, the veil is taken away. And he says, now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. All oh, brothers and sisters, let me get out of here. Can I hear the key of E flat? We can settle for revival when there's something larger to bless us in this day and time. We don't have to be like Moses who put a veil over his face so that his friends, so that his countrymen would not look intently at what was fading away. In this new covenant we have with God, there is a glory that does not fade. It goes from glory to glory, which we praise to our God. We're not called to just pull down strongholds, church. Yes. Tell your neighbor there's something much bigger. Our primary assignment is not pulling down strongholds. Our primary assignment is pulling down the glory of God into our midst. Satan is not the focus of the church. I'm going to say that again. Satan is not the focus of the church. Quit talking to him like he the focus. He ain't the focus. The bridegroom is. Y'all ain't talking back to me. I say the bridegroom is. And the only answer to darkness is to switch on the light. And become so full of Jesus that Jesus fights for you. Tell somebody he fights for me. Yes. When I switch on the light. Tell somebody he fights for me when I switch on the light. My flow comes when I switch on the light. I ain't got to pray all night to switch on the light. My preoccupation is not what the devil is doing, but what the bridegroom has done. If you believe it, shout yes. Yes. The glory of the Lord. We're not seekers of the enemy. We are seekers of God. I ain't trying to stop what the devil is doing. The devil ought to be trying to stop me. Hello, somebody. Why are we chasing down what the devil doing in the world? The devil ought to be trying to stop us. The goal of the church is not to stop the devil. The goal of the church is God's glory. Stopping the devil is the result. The goal of the church is God's glory. Stopping the devil is the result. We done made the result the goal and the goal the result. But the devil is a lie. Give me glory. Glory, 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 glory. Jesus meets a woman at the well. Not to stop what the devil is doing in her life, but to give her a flow. The results was the devil lost his victim. Tell somebody we got to give folks their flow. Hello, somebody. You can't give a flow if you don't have one. Get back in the flow of the spirit. Take your eyes off, folks. What the devil is doing in that life. What's happening in somebody else's life ain't your business. Don't boast about what the devil has done. Boast of what God is doing. Why? Because a lifestyle of intimacy intimidates the devil. I said a lifestyle of intimacy intimidates the devil. You don't have to stop him when you get in your floor. You don't have to stop him when you start praising Jesus. You don't have to stop him when you introduce him to the God in you. Lift your hands and shout glory. When glory hits our cities, we'll get in our flow. We won't just see Jewish healthcare systems. We won't just see Catholic hospitals. We won't just see unsaved private equities running industry running the world which is simply systems that leave God locked out it's time for people of color it's time for the church of God in Christ to get in full glory a glory that spills over into the marketplace hello somebody it's time for the church of God in Christ to get in 
this flow not just feed systems but lead systems y'all ain't talking back to me lead healthcare systems lead financial systems lead logistics systems and if we get out our presiding bishop's way he'll get us in the flow if you know you got anointed leader tell him get me in my flow Jesus showed up at a well to put a woman in a flow. He saw talent in the woman. He saw gifting in the woman. Put them in the flow. Many churches. Can I help you and I'm out of here? Give me three minutes. Many churches are facing the same problem that Moses faced. Where the glory is rapidly fading. Fading from your face. You're in seasons of transition where successes are dwindling. But God says to me to tell the church a new glory of God is about to emerge. What will define the church in the next season is not the usual hallmarks of attendance, of facility, of budgets and equipment, big screens and flashing lights, or even our mission work. What will define the church is the amount of glory that's resting upon the people that spills out into the marketplace as a people that is intent on one thing God's glory if you don't get nothing else tonight just get one thing flow in God's glory I don't want to just believe in the presence of God I don't want to just believe in it I want to see it I want to taste it I want to hear it I want to smell it I want to feel it through our scripture we're taught that the glory of the Lord is the beauty of God which is one of the first characteristics that causes you and I to be enlarged the beauty of the glory will draw people to you can I go get old man Isaiah and Isaiah 60 and I'm out of here he tells us how this glory the glory of Zion is going to come to the people he says glory is going to promote you glory is going to increase you and glory is going to expand you. Zion believers can't stay small when glory get on your life. The glory of God breaks limits off your life. It will enlarge you. When you get glory, small can't keep you down. Glory increases your capacity. It increases your ability to think. I'm scared of us because we can't think anymore. But the Bible says as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Glory comes to make you think, not just jump and shout. When we became preoccupied with glory, that'll just make us dance. That'll just make us holler. And then we don't know how to think when we leave God's house. That's a cheap fabricated glory. But the glory Isaiah spoke about is a glory that'll promote you. A glory that'll increase you. A glory that'll raise you. Oh man, Isaiah said, arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the deep darkness of the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. I got to bid you farewell. When glory comes, it causes you to rise. Where my teachers at in the room? Can we get glory back in the Sunday school classroom? Where my mamas and daddies at? Can we get glory back at the dinner table? Glory, glory, glory. He says the light will cause you to become attractive. Tell somebody you're looking good now. But when more glory get on your life, you're going to look even better. He says the Gentiles are going to come. Kings are going to come. CEO's gonna come. Bishop says, I'm a magnet for money. That's because glory is on him. Don't get the threads mixed up. That's a glory on his life. And it causes kings to come to him. And he's influence, influential, like a magnet. The Bible says you're gonna receive favor. Watch this sponsorship, partnership, glorious projects, continued blessing. People are gonna come to your life because you carry the glory. You won't have to look for them. They're going to look for you. You won't have to recruit in your church when you get the glory back. Quit fighting the devil and bring down glory. Yes, the 
Gentiles shall come to your light kings to your brightness in other words those that are not even in covenant with God are gonna come because of Zion's light kings are gonna come which represents influential people kings are those with authority note the scripture says that when Queen of Sheba yes was attracted to the glory and the wisdom that was on Solomon's life but can I tell you that there is one called Jesus who is greater than Solomon who lives on the inside of you and if Queen Sheba came to Solomon who ought to come to you yes 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 Christ in you the hope of glory I gotta get out of here but if you know he's on the inside tell somebody neighbor you haven't seen nothing yet glory it's gonna cause an increase a gathering anointing oh ain't convention I see us in our future and we're much bigger and we're much brighter and we got sponsors yes we gonna take the city and then the nations for the glory of the Lord if you believe it shout yes yes glory 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 tell somebody I feel glory I feel glory sometime when I have my think time I get alone and I get me a cup of tea and I tell God meet me at my coffee shop brothers when glory get on our life glory carries a weight church is the only place you're supposed to go and gain weight not the buffet not the dinner table when I go to worship you can't fake weight everything that God had in the tabernacle was measured in weight everything in God's house is measured by weight ask somebody how much you weigh I ain't concerned with how much in your pocket I'm concerned with how big your church is how much you weigh the weightiness of God will you lift your hands and receive the Holy Spirit I'm out of time come on here it is wait oh my father that you would be pleased to give us weight weight that transforms and liberates the human soul my father give us weight our programmatics and our methodologies have weighted us down A false sense of stability we have no stability without your glory when storms come we have no stability without your glory be ye steadfast O church unmovable with weight always abounding he says in the work of the Lord which is not stopping the devil for this reason was the son of God manifested that the works of the devil might be destroyed God has already defeated him oh my father and then the psalmist says lift up your head O ye gates he calls us gates we're conduits in which the glory come in and be ye lifted up you everlasting doors we're access points of entry oh yes you go back home go to your business command the glory of God he says and the king will come and the king will come and the king will come through invitation and the king will come who is this king of glory not king of works kings of glory my glory fights for you the weight it is of my presence will scatter the darkness yeah Shandia. yes my father the glory of the Lord I command you to be filled with the Holy Spirit you who hands are raised to God you that love Jesus hold the devil be cast out of your mind and the darkness be scattered tonight and the Lord delivers us <laughs> to exceeding weight of glory yes my father this is your will concerning us and we say yes you who have been given to witty ideas and inventions receive him tonight El Shaddai the all-sufficient God he's sufficient in knowledge and wisdom and understanding 
he shall grant you stature tonight hey hey yes God yes God yes God yes God I speak over every idea that you're burdened and birthing pregnant with tonight that which will liberate and transform the social and economic conditions of our time you who are called to the marketplace forsake not your glory trying to be somebody else at the church dare to be different dare to be different oh and the king of glory he rests upon us your sins be forgiven tonight and the lord heals you i said your sins be forgiven tonight shame be lifted off your life and the lord reveals himself to you tonight will you receive him now come on receive him now spirit upon spirit and it is so hey come on confess the lord jesus confess his presence now yes my father yes to your will in my life all that you would be pleased to dwell with me not through visitation but in habitation dwell with me richly let your brightness scatter the darkness in the corners of my life and i say yes to you will you say yes to him yes to the will of god yes 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 give me 60 more seconds yes lord yes lord yes lord yes hey 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 some of you got to make shifts tonight yay you got to make decisions tonight yay glory is waiting on you you've gotten off the beaten path glory is waiting on you oh my father i'll risk my reputation i'm willing to suffer a season of shame rebuke scorn and rejection that you might be glorified let his glory be your preoccupation glory arise arise and the king is here hey you who are sick in your body watch this if you believe his glory is that lay your hands upon yourself every illness every infirmity goes in remission when glory shows up oh hey 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 one of the members of my church had stage four pancreatic cancer given less than two months to live he called me from md anderson and said pastor he said, I ain't got long to live, but I shall live. I shall live. I said, Sean, you believe it? Hey, let's sanction it in heaven. While you're in Houston, I'm in Louisiana. And this is the will of God concerning you, Sean. You shall live. Cancer has ears to hear. I command you to go in remission. The works of the Lord might be established. Sean shall live out his rightful age and declare the glory of the Lord. Sean, reach for his glory. He was there in MD Anderson. I told him, lift your hands. See, since. Uh, Sean, don't put them down until you feel a weight. I'm helping somebody. Keep your hands up until they become heavy. Sean, don't put them down until you feel a weight coming on it. Oh, Sean, yeah. Command his presence, Sean. Command it. Command it, Sean. It's not enough to pray. Command the glory. We commanded the glory over the phone. Hey, three weeks ago, we celebrated. Sean has no cancer in his body. MD Anderson said, we've never seen anything like it. The glory of the Lord is your answer. Oh, church of God in Christ. The glory of the Lord be upon us again. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. Ah, yes, God. Yes. Is there someone here tonight? Who says, Pastor Ellis, I know that God is talking to me. And I want the prayer of agreement prayed with me tonight. Concerning a matter. That it will take God's glory to bring transformation to my situation. If that's you, will you come to this altar quickly? Be not ashamed. That's it. It's great when the apostolic leadership recognizes it. Preachers and pastors and those who give into the fivefold ministry. Oh, my Father. Yes to your will. Oh, Glory. You won't need Prozac when glory get on your life. Glory. Oh my father, oh my father, yes to your will. You who struggle with habit and addiction, lift your hands, keep saying glory, 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 glory. As you walk this way, glory arrests you, apprehends you. Hey, yes, yes, you simply acknowledge, glory is my assignment, glory is my assignment, glory is my assignment, glory is my assignment. Glorious my assignment. Glorious my assignment. Hey, glorious my assignment. And the glory of the Lord comes upon you. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, you're going to find your flow tonight. These are those that need a flow for what's next. I need a flow 
I can't keep going the way I'm going, my Father. Grant unto me all sufficiency for the assignment that's given to me. Your glory is more than enough. My glory, my glory, my glory. The Holy Ghost comes upon you now. My glory, my glory, my glory, my glory, my glory. As it was with Ezra, the hand of the Lord be upon you now. Feel his hand. You need not let another touch you. And the hand of the Lord be upon you. When you sense glory, start taking your liberty. Say to yourself, I am healed. I am delivered. I'm made whole. And the Lord grants me the gift of wisdom, all sufficiency of knowledge, the gift of understanding. He grants unto me visions and dreams to give full expression to his glory. That's upon my life. I shall see again. I shall dream again. Yes. Yes. Not for to impress men, but that he might be glorified. Glorified in all things. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I wish I had some praises and some prayers in the room. Yes, God. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You don't need to fall out for this glory. Just walk in it. Glory. Glory, 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 glory. You're the king and you're invited to come in. We welcome you in. I want you going home singing that. We welcome you in. My father, you're the king and you're invite to me I'm telling you healing is in the room lay your hand on your to the sanctuary oh, da, da, da. it's tabernacle tell him St. Louis you're the king and you're invite ride through your city and just tell him we welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you. Sanctuary. Lord, give me ideas. Let your glory be seen. Oh, black America, we can't just be consumers. Feeding systems, we must lead them now. Every God idea that transform economic conditions of our people. The Lord grant you all sufficiency. Go forward. Tell somebody, find your flow. To the sanctuary. Oh, my father. Ah. Go back home and lay your hands on your child. Tell them the glory of the Lord be upon you. Invite them to lift their hands to God. Sense the weightiness of his presence. You can feel him. You can sense him. Oh, taste and see the psalmist. Taste him. At 24 years old, he took the taste of alcohol and drugs out of my mouth. Hey! You're the king, my father. You're invited. 30 more seconds. Somebody's laboring for the breakthrough. You don't just need a breakthrough, you need a breaking away. Glory breaks you away. Hey. Oh, my father. Oh, the king. Oh, I wish I had time. Come come in. Hey, yes. Uh, I believe in his presence tonight. I believe. I believe the all sufficient God. You're more than enough. <laughs> no devil, no demon in hell hey, can handle the weight of your glory. Open your mouth. Receive your prayer language. You that have never spoken in your prayer language, I dare you to open up your mouth and praise it. And the Holy Ghost will rest upon your tongue. Hey, yes, God. Heaven will hear his language tonight. Give yourself to him for full use. We welcome you into this tabernacle.
Thank you for watching the Jonathan Desvernay Gospel Channel. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Never alone, never alone, he walks with me